Good evening, everyone. My name is Miriam Mayer, and I am an adult services specialist for Gwinnett County Public Library. Thank you for joining us tonight for our Meet the Author series featuring New York Times bestselling author John Furling in conversation with local historian Jean Ramsey. They will discuss John's new book, Winning Independence, The Decisive Years of the Revolutionary War. Now I would like to introduce our moderator for tonight. Jean Ramsey was born in North Carolina and received a PhD degree from Georgia Tech School of Industrial and Systems Engineering and worked in the supply chain consulting and software development industry. As a longtime resident of the Atlanta area and currently a resident of the city of Norcross, Jean became involved and an expert in local history. Jean Ramsey writes articles for the award-winning journal of the Gwinnett Historical Society, The Heritage, he has developed and led guided tours of the Fox Theater, the Oakland Cemetery in Atlanta, and Norcross City Cemetery, and downtown historic Norcross. He also worked with two co-authors to produce the book, Images of America, Norcross. Jean is also a speaker on local history and presents to local civic groups. Please welcome Jean Ramsey. Thank you, Miriam. It's a pleasure to be here tonight and to be able to introduce John Furling. John is a uh, retired professor from the University of West Georgia, his main uh, location during his career. Uh, he was born in West Virginia and grew up in Texas, and got interested in history and pursued it as a life's work. A lot of his research over the years has been devoted to the American Revolutionary War period. And he's written a number of books, uh, something like a dozen or so. Uh, on various subjects having mainly to do with that period. Uh, I noticed ones uh, that were uh, dealing with Washington as a politician, that's George Washington as a politician. Uh, the, uh, the presidential contest of 1800, which was a, a knockdown drag out affair uh, in, from what I've read about it and, uh, and various other topics uh, in that era. But his latest book is a book called Winning Independence, and it's about the last four years, essentially, of the American Revolutionary War. Uh, and here he looks uh, in detail at the, the many of the commanders involved and how they approach the fight. Uh, people like George Washington on the American uh, rebel side uh, and Sir Henry Clinton on the British side. And a number of people from, uh, from the French forces, uh, Lafayette and others uh, who participated as well. Uh, and uh, the, the generals such as uh, Cornwallis uh, and Nathaniel Green who fought in the South are, are mainly known for, for that part of the country. But, um, but he's gonna discuss the book for us uh, tonight. And it, I, have, uh, I found it was very detailed and had a lot of information in it. A lot more than uh, I was aware of, but obviously he's an expert on this subject. Uh, so, John, uh, I'd like to have a conversation with you, and please feel free. I know you've got some slides. Uh, if you want to bring those up at any time, that's fine with me. So, uh, how did how did you get involved in, uh, in in developing a book along these lines? I'm sure there were other subjects you could have looked at if you'd wanted to. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Gene, for for your uh, introduction and. Uh, I'm, I've been looking forward to this for, for some time. I, I think I, I really got interested in, uh, in the topic a long time ago because um, I, I think um, the, the, the period after the British Army under John Burgoyne surrendered at Saratoga in October of 1777 is a relatively forgotten period of the, of the war. Uh, Saratoga was a crucial event. An entire British army surrendered there, and um, uh, the, that cataclysmic defeat for the British brought uh, France into the war as an American ally. And, and without uh, the the help provided by French over the, the France over the next few years, America couldn't have won the the war. And so I think virtually every textbook that's ever been written on American history has characterized 
uh, Saratoga as the turning point of the Revolutionary War. And certainly it was crucial. I, I'm not, not uh, debating that. But because people have thought of it as the turning point of the Revolutionary War, I think a great many people uh, tend to think that if it was the turning point, then independence after that must have been guaranteed. And um, I, don't, I disagree with that. And in fact, I think the, the war um, soon turned into a stalemate after Saratoga. And it went on for four long years, 1778 uh, until Yorktown in 1781. It, it was a, a desperate struggle for America eventually. At, at the outset, right after Saratoga, General Washington thought that uh, the war was about over. He, he was uh, seldom an optimist, uh, optimist but he, I think he was in, in, in early 1778. He, he thought that either Britain would see the futility of continuing the war or the combined forces of France and the United States would defeat the British, handing it a decisive defeat and, and causing it to drop out of the war and grant American independence. So Washington was optimistic and his counterpart, Sir Henry Clinton, who was the commander of the British army, was pessimistic at that point. In fact, he, he was writing friends back in England and saying that, that he, he thought uh, Britain's defeat was now inevitable. Uh, my fate is hard, Clinton said in one of his, his letters. And the reason he said that was not only had an entire British army been lost at Saratoga, but in, in the same letter in which he reads that he's been named commander of the British army, he's also told that he has to relinquish 8,000 of his men. They have to be sent to the Caribbean to meet this new threat by France. So he's gonna have an army about one third smaller than his predecessor had had, but he has to fight not only the United States, but France as well, which was just now coming into the war. So uh, things look pretty, pretty good for the Americans, pretty bleak for the British. And what I try to argue in the book is that the war stalemated and the tide turned, so to speak. And by 1781, things actually looked better for the British than they did for the the Americans, not, not that Britain was about to, to crush the entire American rebellion, but that Britain was on the verge of coming out of the war with something, maybe with as many as three American states or colonies as the British uh, uh, call them. So anyway, kind of a long answer to your, your question, why did I get interested in it? But um, the answer is that that I, I wanted to um, uh, tell readers that, uh, that independence was far from inevitable after Saratoga. And it's a long, interesting, desperate war that goes on uh, after that. In fact, I think probably about 60% uh, of all uh, of the American casualties in this war occurred after 1778 and the period that I'm writing about. So it was a grim period. Definitely. As I read your, your account, you know, it, it did seem like a stalemate, as you say. And, and I see part of that, I mean, there were, there were a number of factors, it seems to me, on both sides of the conflict as to why it got into a stalemate. Uh, both Washington and Clinton had some constraints on them that that um, that limited what they were able to do and and what they knew. I wonder if you could address some of those things. Sure. Yeah, I I think uh, Washington says right after Saratoga, in fact, it's during the Valley Forge winter, that uh, from this point on he was going to avoid taking risks. And uh, he, he was, his actual term was, I'm not gonna act with impetuosity, as he put it. And uh, he, he didn't really define what he was thinking, but I think if you look at Washington's conduct after 1778, uh, that what Washington is really thinking, I believe, is that 
uh, henceforth, he was not going to act uh, without the sanction of the French and without the help of the, the French. It was just too risky uh, and, and uh, uh, to go into a battle and lose an army might lead France to drop out of the war. So he's, he takes a very conservative uh, approach uh, from, from that point on. And uh, on the other side, his counterpart, Clinton, as I said earlier, had a shrunken army. Uh, he, he, uh, he, he was limited to a considerable degree because of uh, a lack of, of manpower. He was all constantly writing back to London and, and, and pleading for reinforcements. And he got some, but he never got the, the, the amount of reinforcements that, that he needed. But, but having said that, I, I don't want to leave the impression that Clinton was a do-nothing general. He, he was acti uh, actually uh, far more active than Washington was in this, this four-year period. Um, at the end of 1778, he sent an expedition down to Savannah, 3,000 man expedition. And in one day, it defeated uh, the American army defending Savannah and it took Savannah. And once Savannah was taken, the royal governor of Georgia, was re who had been ousted back in 1776, was reinstated and a pro-British uh, legislature was reinstated and it immediately repealed every act that had been passed by the rebels since, uh, since 1776. And in fact, uh, Clinton then in, in 1780 uh, sent uh, an army down, a large expedition again, down to South Carolina and conducted a siege of Charleston and captured an American, captured the city of Charleston and um, uh, captured the American army that was defending it. And uh, just about as many Americans surrendered at uh, Charleston as, uh, uh, as the number of British that had surrendered at Saratoga uh, 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 three years earlier. So Clinton was, was, was active in that score. He was conducting raids on the American uh, coast. He set a, a, a raiders into Virginia. They liberated slaves. They burned crops. They destroyed uh, shipbuilding uh, facilities and whatever. And all of those were designed to try to lure Washington out into the field and uh, so that he, he could give a battle to, to Washington. But Washington, again, said, I'm not going to act impetuously. And um, so uh, Clinton could never get Washington into the field uh, until very late in 1781. But it, but it did seem to me after Lord Germain suggested and, and really ordered Clinton to follow as a Southern strategy that it worked pretty well for a time. Right, yeah, let me, uh, let me try to call up a slide here and see, see what we can, can do with this. Uh, okay, can, can you see the slides there? Yes. No, okay, good. Let me see if I can advance. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, here's Lord Germain that you mentioned. And uh, Germain's position in the uh, ministry in London was as uh, American secretary or secretary of state for American affairs, which really made him uh, in charge, put him in charge of the British army in America. And, and he was sort of tantamount to uh, a war minister uh, in, in that position. And uh, since uh, the British strategy uh, in the first 30 months of the war had failed, uh, uh, they, they had not defeated the Continental Army, they, they had uh, not gained control of, of any Northern uh, states, that Germain knew that uh, he had to devise a different strategy. And the strategy that he came up with was, uh, uh, has, 
came to be called by historians, the Southern strategy. And the idea behind the Southern strategy was that Germain thought correctly, I believe, based on a number of, uh, of uh, historical studies that have been made over the last several years. Germain believed that there was a larger number of loyalists or people who remain loyal to Great Britain living in the Southern states than was true in the Northern states, or Germain would have called them colonies, not, not states. And the reason for that, I think, is that uh, Southerners were shipping rice and tobacco to, uh, throughout the British Empire. They had ready markets. They were making lots of money for that. There were religious causes in that the Anglican Church was the established church in all of the Southern colonies. Lots of the Southerners were, were Anglicans, and so they had ties to England because of that. And, and slavery, of course, is always a factor in everything in Southern history in the 17th, 18th, and 19th uh, centuries. And uh, uh, many, many Southerners were afraid uh, that uh, uh, the uh, that, that if America did gain independence, that uh, the slavery system would be abolished. So that, that caused many of them to remain tied to, to England as well. So Germain thought that there was a chance that several Southern uh, colonies might be regained by England. And in fact, uh, this uh, map, pretty much would show what Germain might have been thinking. He believed that you can see Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina down there at the bottom of the, of the American uh, states. And um, th those were the targets that Germain was hoping to, uh, to gain uh, because Britain already controlled Florida. They had won control of Florida in a war that was fought against France and Spain back in the 1750s and 1760s. They still controlled everything out west of the Appalachian Mountains and they still controlled Canada. So if the Southern strategy succeeded, then the United States would have come out of the war, perhaps with its independence, but it would have consisted only of that area that is shown in red on that map. And it would have been completely surrounded by British territories. Uh, and the United States, uh, small and hemmed in, would have faced a rather bleak and uncertain future. And in fact, I doubt that it could have remained independent very very long. It wouldn't have been able to expand and uh, there would have been pressure under those circumstances to probably eventually rejoin uh, the, the empire, maybe, maybe on a different status than before the revolution, maybe something like Canada's status, a commonwealth uh, status. But Britain would have come out of the war with a great deal of territory in America. They still had a great deal of, uh, a great many colonies in the Caribbean. So if you add all that together, Britain would, would have, if the Southern strategy uh, succeeded, Britain would have, um, would have come out of the war with something that wouldn't have lost everything. And it was up to Sir Henry Clinton who was appointed the commander of the British Army in, in May of 1778 to uh, try to, to implement the Southern strategy. And that's, that's his task. That's what he wrestles with uh, from 1778 to Yorktown in, in 1781. And, and since we've talked about Clinton a little bit, and I mentioned his name, let me just uh, uh, tell the, um, the viewers uh, a bit about uh, Clinton, because he's a major figure who probably isn't that well known uh, any longer. Um, Clinton was uh, two years older than Washington. He was 50 years old 
1778 when he's appointed commander of the of the British Army. Unlike Washington, he came from an aristocratic background. His father uh, was part of the British aristocracy. His father had been a career naval officer who, who uh, also was the royal governor of, Virgi of uh, New York in, when Clinton was a young boy. So Clinton actually uh, spent part of his boyhood growing up in, um, in New York City. And he entered the British Army when he was a teenager. So he had been a, a professional British soldier for more than 30 years by the time of the Revolutionary War. He had fought in two wars before the revolution. He had seen combat in both of those wars. He was seriously wounded in a battle in Germany during the Seven Years' War in 1761. And uh, he served with distinction as the number two in command of the British Army um, in 1776 and 1777. And he gained a, a reputation as perhaps the best strategist among the British officers in America. So it's Clinton who, who has to implement the, the Southern strategy, and it's Clinton who will get blamed eventually for Britain's defeat at, uh, at Yorktown in 1781, which uh, did not do much for his, uh, for his reputation. And uh, one of the things that I try to do in, in winning independence is rehabilitate uh, Clinton. I, I don't think that Clinton was necessarily a great general, but I think he was a good general. And um, I, I don't think that, um, as many historians have argued, uh, that Britain was ultimately defeated because Clinton was too passive. I, I think he was quite an active general and and uh, came closer to uh, to to get to to carrying out the Southern strategy successfully. He came closer than than even he had thought would would be possible. Yeah, well, he may have been passive at part at times, but it was because of the orders he had it, it was part of my read to it right yeah yeah he he well, was he, he was always uh following germain's orders germain was his boss and he was trying to do what germain told him uh to do so he he did not have a great deal of latitude uh and and that irked clinton enormously he he at, at one point proposed that what Britain should do is create a supreme commander in America, sort of like the, the position that was created for Dwight Eisenhower in World War II when he became the supreme commander of the Allied armies in, in, in Western Europe uh, during that, that war. And uh, what, what Clinton thought was if, if he could, if that position was created, and of course he was thinking that he would be the one that would be appointed to be the supreme commander, then he could really coordinate action uh, here in North America and down in the Caribbean fighting against the French as as well. So he wanted a freer hand, but um, uh, Germain just would not would not give it to him. Yeah. Well, the, the Southern strategy was pretty successful at the beginning, uh, as you've said, uh, when Clinton and the others were fighting against troops led by Lincoln and then later Howe, I believe. Uh, right. And at that point, the Washington uh, brought in a new commander for the South, uh, Nathaniel Green, and things changed. Do you, you want to talk about him a sure, bit? Sure, sure. Yeah, let me, uh, let me just back up just a second before I get to Green that between December of 1778 and August of 1780, uh, the, the Americans suffered four catastrophic defeats in the, in the South. Two of them were in Savannah uh, in, in December of 1778, and then again in the fall of, of 1779. Uh, they also, of course, lost at Charleston, as I mentioned, uh, earlier, and in August of 1780, Cornwallis 
and uh, let's see, there's there's whoops, there's a picture of General Cornwallis, who Clinton left in command in South Carolina once Charleston was taken, and Clint and Cornwallis's orders were to pacify the back country in in uh, South Carolina and in Georgia, and if possible, go into North Carolina as well and take it uh, too. And Cornwallis defeated an American army under Horatio Gates at Camden in South Carolina in, um, in August of 1780. And Gates had been, in fact, the American hero at Saratoga uh, three years earlier. So those four American defeat, in those four American defeats, the American law, Americans lost more men than the British lost at Saratoga in 1778 and uh, 1777. And in fact, um, once uh, Cornwallis defeats uh, Gates at, at, at uh, Camden in South Carolina, Washington wrote a letter to um, uh, the chief executive of Pennsylvania, who was a friend of his, and he, he acknowledged, I have almost given up hope of gaining independence. I mean, things looked that bleak in August of 1780. And uh, uh, at the very same moment that Washington was writing that letter, Arthur Lee from Virginia who had gone to England before the Revolutionary War and then served as an American diplomat for several years in Europe during the war, returned to America, landed in Boston in August of 1780. He hadn't been here since before the war started. And it, it only took him a few days meeting a few people in Boston and uh, leaders in Massachusetts and he came away with the, the conviction that most of those people, and this is Boston. I mean, we think of, of Boston uh, as um, never, never willing to concede anything uh, to, to the British. It's, it's the home of the Boston Tea Party and uh, many other things. But Arthur Lee concluded that most of the leaders in Massachusetts by this point um, uh, had such a bleak view of things that they thought the war would end in a negotiated settlement and that America would have to accept less than independence. So it would come out of the war without independence. And so in other words, Arthur Lee thought the Southern strategy was going to work. And it was at that point really that Washington selects Nathaniel Green to command the army in the South. It's like the fifth or sixth uh, army that Congress has sent down into the South uh, during during this war. And um, every time that an army was sent down into the South, Congress approached Washington and, and in essence said, who, who do you want to command that army? And Washington always refused to get involved. He knew it was a political decision. He knew he would make enemies. He knew it would be divisive, and so he stayed out of it. But at this point, after Camden, uh, the, uh, when Congress asked Washington, who do you want to command the army in the South, Washington didn't hesitate. He said, I want Nathaniel Green. And uh, Nathaniel Green was from, I don't think I have a slide of, of Green, unfortunately, but uh, Nathaniel Green was um, from Rhode Island, and he was one of the original dozen general officers chosen by Congress for the Continental Army back in, in 1775. He, he had almost no military experience. In fact, he was a private in, uh, in the Rhode Island militia, and he's elevated from the rank of private to general. In, uh, in one fell swoop. Uh, but uh, Washington almost immediately saw something in, in Green during the siege of Boston in 1775, 1776. Washington was uh, a really good judge 
of, uh, of man. And uh, he, um, he discerned some qualities in green that perhaps other people uh, couldn't see. And in fact, early on, uh, Washington told Congress, if anything happens to me and you have to name somebody to succeed me, I, I would recommend Green. And that, that was as early as 1776. So he believed in, the, in Nathaniel Green. And I can't say enough good things about Green. Green took over the uh, Continental Army, just a small army of 2,000 men in the South, in, um, in, in North Carolina in December of 17, uh, 1780. And he's in command then of the, of the battles, that, of, the, of the struggle that goes on in South Carolina and North Carolina and uh, Georgia. There's another Continental Army in Virginia under the Marquis of, of Lafayette, de Lafayette, but he and Green never, never got together. Lafayette stayed in Virginia. Green is down in the Carolinas and Georgia, and he conducts a really very savvy and aggressive uh, um, uh, campaign against Cornwallis, wins battles at Cowpens in January of 1781, Guilford Courthouse in March of 1781, and manages to retake uh, many of the interior posts that the, um, that the British had gained since, since Charleston. And I, I should add just parenthetically that, that Green was not doing this entirely alone. Um, a partisan movement developed in the, in the South. Um, I think in reaction to uh, what they saw as, what, people, what the, the citizenry saw as heavy handedness on the part of the British soldiers, uh, British Army in the South, but also because um, they, they fervently wanted uh, independence to get out of the empire and, and control their, their own destiny. And so there are lots of partisan forces under people like uh, Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter and Andrew Pickens and, and others. Uh, some of the viewers may have seen the, the Mel Gibson movie, The Patriot, which dealt with that. Hollywood always takes <laughs> some liberties, and I had some, some questions about some of the things in the, in the movie, but it did deal with the, with the, the partisan movement, and, and Green certainly benefited somewhat from the partisans. I don't want to overplay what the, the partisans did. They, they helped Green. They were, they were useful to green, but it was mostly uh, mostly green uh, that um, that that really carried out the successful campaign in the South. I think he was lucky to have the services of uh, Daniel Morgan for a time, at least. Yeah, well. yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, Morgan is one of those guys, one of my favorite guys in the in the Revolution. He he was a commoner from Virginia, from just a very humble background, had fought in a number of uh, wars against uh, the Indians and against the French uh, before the, the Revolutionary War. He uh, uh, leads a rifle company and rises in the ranks in the Continental Army. He's a general by uh, 1780 and uh, 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 Green relies in the early going on Morgan, and it was Morgan that that uh, uh, commanded the forces out in western South Carolina that defeated Vanastra Tarleton at uh, at Calpens in January of, of 1781. Uh, Morgan uh, had uh, uh, he he was not in in real good health. He had uh, severe back problems by this point. And they were so severe that after Calpins, he, he had to hang it up and he went back up to Virginia and he doesn't really see any more action uh, during this, um, uh, this, this war. But he was, he was an excellent strategist and tactician and um, uh, is to boot just a really in interesting fellow. I think he, you know, Washington and Green to some degree too, distrusted the, the militia. 
they looked down on militiamen and, and to some degree thought that they were more trouble than, than they were, were worth. But uh, Green came, uh, Morgan rather, came from the same kind of background as most of the, the militiamen. And I think, I think he understood their mentality, he understood how to motivate them, he understood how to use them in the battle. And uh, uh, he at, at Calpens, and it, it, it should have been a lesson to others. And, uh, but but no one was really as good with the militia as as Morgan, probably because of the of the background that he came from. Yeah, it certainly seemed to me that his strategy of uh, using the militia for two or three shots and then uh, drawing him back right worked very well in uh, in setting up the battle the way he wanted it to be set up. Right. Yeah. He he told told his militiamen get off about three shots and then, then retreat behind the, the regulars. And uh, that, was the, that was what they did at, uh, at Calpens and, and the strategy worked uh, really well. At, at Guilford Courthouse, he wasn't there. He had gone back to, to Virginia uh, because of his, his sciatic, uh, sciatica problems by then, but uh, he, he wrote a letter that's uh, kind of an alarming letter to, uh, to Green on the eve of the engagement at, at Calpens, uh, at uh, Guilford Courthouse, which, which is, by the way, near uh, Greensboro, present day Greensboro, uh, North Carolina. And he told uh, Green, he, he, he encouraged Green to use the same strategy that he had used at Calpens, but he also told him, put a few guys in the back. And if the militiamen break and run, have them shoot down the militiamen. I mean, it sounds very much like, like the tactics that Stalin employed uh, in the Red Army in, in World War II. And it's been quite a debate among historians over whether Green actually permitted that to, uh, to occur. I, I think the, the, that there is some, I think the most credible evidence myself is that men were put back there. Whether they ever actually gunned anybody down, though, is, is difficult to tell. It seems to me that um, in that phase of the Southern strategy, Cornwallis was chasing Green and, and Morgan to some extent uh, all over North Carolina without really catching them uh, where he could most effectively fight them. Uh, Guilford Courthouse, Green chose that spot and it was sort of a draw as I read it. Um, and, then Cor and then Cornwallis went to the coast and, uh, and regrouped because his men had been in the field for so long. And at that, at that point, he had a choice to make. And it seems to me that that was a big impact on the, on the fighting for the rest of the year. Right, a absolutely. I, uh, Cornwallis chased Morgan and Green, as you said, really from uh, Western North Carolina all the way over to uh, present day Greensboro. And he really exhausted his army. I mean, they were living off the land. About a hundred of his men died in that chase. A lot of them drowned crossing uh, rain swollen uh, rivers. They were just living out without tents and without proper clothing, without uh, adequate food, trying to live off the, the land. And his army was not in really good shape when he went into the engagement at at Guilford Courthouse. And technically, Guilford Courthouse was a British victory because Cornwallis gained control of the field at the end of the battle. But it was um, uh, really a pure victory for, for Cornwallis because he lost far more, far more men than, than Green lost, and his army was, was uh, uh, severely weakened. Let me let me take just a second and go back here to to uh, this if I if I can. Uh, I wanted to to mention there we go. Wanted to mention something. Oops.
There, there we go. Okay, I wanted to mention something that uh, by the beginning of 1781, uh, Clinton knew that not only uh, uh, Calpins and Guilford Courthouse, but uh, uh, he had lost a thousand men at Kings Mountain in uh, October of 1780. And there were all these partisans that were, were developing. And so Clinton had to come up with some sort of strategy. And remember I mentioned earlier on that Clinton had a reputation as perhaps the best strategist among the, the general officers. So here's what Clinton decided that he had to do in order to uh, give Cornwallis the aid that could actually lead to a success in the Southern strategy. Uh, for the first time in the war, uh, Clinton put a large British army in Virginia, uh, starting in December of 1780, and then he gradually increased the army so that by April of 1781, he has 6,000 men in Virginia. And they're there to try to shut down the flow of supplies to the partisans and to Green's army in the South. America got most of its supplies from abroad. And those supplies tended to come in to New England ports. And then from New England, they came down through New York and uh, Philadelphia and Maryland and Delaware and into Virginia. And then from Virginia, they crossed into, into the Carolinas. And Clinton reasoned that if he could shut down the flow of supplies, Green would have nothing left to fight with. The partisans would have nothing left to fight with. And uh, the, the war could be won in the, in the Carolinas. So this 6,000 man army in Virginia is to destroy uh, rebel supply bases, supply depots, and it's also to interdict the flow of supplies into the Carolinas. And I think it could have succeeded. The problem was that when Germain, and remember Lord Germain back up here, the American secretary, when Germain learns that, that what Clinton wants to do, and he's, he's supportive of Clinton putting an army into Virginia. But all along, Clinton, Clinton knew by in early 1781 that the French were going to send over a large armada at the end of the summer of 1781. It would be the, the fleet under Admiral de Graz uh, that, that would arrive. And Clinton was absolutely convinced that what Washington and the French army in America under Rochambeau would try to do would be to, take, to retake New York. He knew that Washington was obsessed with taking uh, New York. And he thought that was the biggest prize of all. And that, that's what they, that's what Clinton thought that's what they would go for. So Clinton's plan, it was he had 6,000 men in Virginia, but he didn't plan to leave them there forever. He was going to withdraw them in the summer of 1781 back to New York to get ready for this attack by the, the Allied combined naval and land forces of the of the Allies. And when he starts to do that, he actually sends orders down and the troops begin loading on transports in Portsmouth, Virginia to come to New York. And, and uh, uh, Germain got word of that. And Germain wrote to Clinton and, and said, the king and I do not want you to take one man out of Virginia. So that entire army remains in Virginia. And as we know, it becomes essentially a sitting duck for, uh, for the, the allied forces. Uh, this is Rochambeau who commanded the, the French army in America. It had arrived in 
July of 1780. This is Admiral de Graz, whose fleet will come over. And de Graz does come to the Chesapeake and traps an army under Cornwallis, an army of 7,500 uh, British soldiers at Yorktown uh, on the, um, on the, in the peninsula between the James and the York rivers. And in the siege of Yorktown in October of 1781, it's curtains for the, for the, the British. Cornwallis, after a siege that goes on for about a month, uh, surrenders his entire army. And that's the decisive uh, Allied victory that leads to the, to, the, to the British, to not just Cornwallis' surrender, but leads the British to uh, drop out of the war and grant America independence. Yeah. Big event. Uh, yeah. We had a question in the Q&A uh, about the sources that you use uh, for this book. And uh, I know from having looked at the uh, list of sources in the back that um, you must have read every book in the, in the library, or well, several libraries. But I wonder if you could talk about your approach to that. Yeah, sure. I, there, there's a, there are a great many uh, documents that are available in print. Washington's papers are in print. They, they run down to late 1779, the modern editorial um, a version. See, some for the more recent ones, you have to use online sources or an older edition of Washington's papers that came out in the in the 1940s. Green's papers are fully uh, out and in in print. Lafayette's papers are are in print. Cornwallis's papers during 1780 and 81 in the South are available in print. That's a relatively new new uh, edition. They, they only came out about seven or eight years ago. And Clinton's papers are available at the University of Michigan. I'm not sure how it happened, but sometime in the 1920s, someone purchased Clinton's papers in London and gave them all to the University of Michigan, to the Clements Library uh, in Ann Arbor at the university. So um, I, I was able to do a great deal of work right here at the University of West Georgia Library using things that were in print. A lot of things, a lot of journals and diaries and whatever were published uh, um, back during the bicentennial of the American Revolution uh, in 1976. So they, they were available. Over the years that I taught at West Georgia, I was able to build up that, that collection in the library. And then I made a trip to, to Ann Arbor and spent a few days there working in the, with, the, uh, with the Clinton uh, papers. So that, um, that, that, those were the original sources that I, I used. There's really a lot out there. And then in the bibliography of, the, of my book, I could have gone on and on with this, but I listed 101 books that uh, I recommended as secondary sources. Anybody who wants to know um, about things re uh, regarding the war between 1778 and 1781, you can find them in, in, a, in these assorted 101 uh, one books. So that, that was, th those were the sources that, that I used. Great. I had another question from the audience uh, asking whether uh, the mental illnesses that King George uh, supposedly had over the years, did that have any effect on the conflict in North America and uh, the prosecution of that by the British? I, I don't think it really did. I think that was later on. He, I think he had some troubles during this time, but I don't think it affected his... Uh, his uh, uh, decision making during this 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 period, he mostly stayed out of things and left it to uh, to Parliament and to Germain. They were the ones that made most of the decisions. Uh, Lord North was the head of the ministry. Even Lord North uh, was was sort of passive and was more just a manager of his ministry. 
So Germain is really the guy that, that makes most of the key decisions uh, regarding uh, British strategy and British actions from, from 1778 on. There's no question that, that, uh, um, that, that George III, the British monarch, did not want to lose America. And in fact, after Saratoga, there's quite a debate in North's ministry. It, it, it goes on for a period of several weeks over whether it was worth staying in the war or not. Since France was coming in, a lot of the ministers said, let's forget America. We, 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 we've had 30 months to suppress the rebellion. We haven't succeeded. Let's focus on uh, France from, from this point on. And uh, George III, was, I mean, he, he kept telling the ministers, no, I, I think we can still win the war in America. So he backed Germain uh, when Germain came up with the Southern strategy. Okay, and another question I had uh, coming up, and I, I know we're very close to the end of the time here. One thing that impressed me was the time lags in communications from the various parties involved here with Germain being in London and Clinton somewhere in, uh, in America and Cornwallis somewhere else in America. I wonder if you could comment on that uh, and the French fleet, nobody ever knowing where they were, they just show up. Sure, the, um, I think the fastest voyage between England and North America was 22 days. And uh, I mean, that, that's during the 18th century, not, not just in the war. It usually took um, somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30 days to, to make an Atlantic crossing. And sometimes it, it took a lot longer than that. Thomas Paine and John Lawrence went to France to try to get money and, and uh, military uh, provisions in 1781 before Yorktown. And they hoped to make a rapid trip back across the Atlantic. It took them eight weeks. They were eight weeks, if you can imagine, at sea uh, before they, they got back. So there's those kind of lags. But then th there's also lags oftentimes when Washington would correspond with Green and vice versa. Washington, for the most part, was in New York. And Green was down in North or South Carolina. It, it usually took two weeks or more for, uh, for, for their uh, communication to, to bear, bear fruit. And Clinton was having the same kind of problems with, uh, with, with Cornwallis. So uh, that, that's the, uh, the, the communication were, were a real problem all through the war for, for, for both sides. And as far as de Grasse was concerned, as I said, Clinton knew that he was coming. I uh, knew it as early as about March, but he, he knew that it wouldn't be until late summer. De Grasse would go to the Caribbean until the hurricane season came in. Then he would get out of the Caribbean and come up here. So the, uh, the assumption was it would be August at the earliest, maybe September before he came. It turned out to be September before he actually arrived. And But he didn't Clinton didn't know where he was was coming, and um, the and and uh, De Graz comes to to the Caribbean. A, a British, actually a British force, uh, an armada that was put together down in the Caribbean that was supposed to trail um, uh, De Graz. It knew when De Graz left, but it 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 sailed a different route, looking for De Graz. And they, uh, what happened was the British fleet was using copper bottomed vessels, which were much faster than the slower non copper bottomed vessels that the, the French used. So the British fleet arrived in the Caribbean in late August of 1781, or arrived in the Chesapeake in late August of 1781. That British admiral looked around. He couldn't find De Graz, and he assumed made a lot. He made a logical conclusion: if De Graz isn't here in the Caribbean, he's not coming, or if he's not here in the Chesapeake, he's not coming to the Chesapeake. He has to be going to New York. Uh, 
So that British fleet went to New York and it passed on the word to, to Clinton. Uh, De Grasse is off the coast of Virginia, so he must be headed in your direction. And that was what Clinton thought until it was too late. And the French and the American army marched down to, to uh, Virginia and with De Grasse trapped Cornwallis at Yorktown. You said that the Cornwallis papers were relatively recently available. Did you find anything there that um, impacted what you, you know, your conclusions about this four year period? Well, yeah, it's really a treasure trove of, uh, of information because it's, it involves correspondence between uh, Cornwallis and his officers in Virginia, uh, his officers in uh, South Carolina and in North Carolina. So you can really see kind of the evolution of Cornwallis's thinking. You can see the problems that he's up against and it, it really has been a, a meaningful addition to uh, the literature on the, on the war. It was put together by a, a British scholar named Ian Saberton and came out, I, I forget the year, 2012 or 13. It's a fairly, fairly recent thing. It's a six volume uh, set of papers and it only covers the period from the time that Cornwallis takes command in June of 1780 until his surrender at Yorktown in October of 1781. So it only spans a period of 15 or 16 months and it runs six volumes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay, well, I think we're, um, we're getting towards the end of our time here and I wanna thank you very much for your participation. This was great. I learned a lot reading the book and even more hearing you talk about it. So uh, Miriam, can I turn it back over to you now? Yes, you may, Jane. All right. Well, thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you to Mr. John Furling and to our moderator, Jane Ramsey, for this insightful conversation of our nation's history of how we were able to clinch victory in the War of Independence and how it wasn't as easy as it seemed to be. So again, thank you so much for that, um, John and Jean. Uh, if you have not purchased your thank, copy. Thank you, Miriam, and thank you, Jean, and thank you for inviting me. I, I appreciate it. I've been looking forward to it and I enjoyed it. Yes, we, we enjoyed it as well, John. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.